All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle Angelari, and I'm the executive director of NAMI Northern Illinois. And I want to thank you for coming to our Path to Recovery event, which is a part of Mental Illness Awareness Week this year. Um, I don't know if you've kept, caught anything that we've been doing so far. Um, started off at the YMCA on Sunday, traveled over to OSF to do a cooking class yesterday, and now on to tonight's main event. Um, Mental illness impacts everyone, and unfortunately, stigma and misunderstanding are also widespread. That's why each year, during the first full week of October, NAMI Northern Illinois and participants across the country raise awareness on this topic. Um, this year, we're focusing on being kind to your mind. We can't create a more accepting community without you. Um, hopefully, you can continue participating with us this week. Um, again, thank you for coming. If you have any questions for our presenters um, after they're done speaking, then I ask that you put that in the chat box and I will navigate them with them. Um, Xavier, I'll turn it over to you. Hi everyone. I wanted to um, introduce our first speaker who, who is Erica Sharon. Um, she's a recovering alcoholic who struggled with anxiety and depression for years. Five years ago, she decided to start an important work of healing her past. She uses art as an outlet on her journey and has started two businesses. Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I wasn't sure. I was talking and I wasn't uh, I didn't know if you guys were hearing me. So I'll start over. <laughs> I don't know how far I got, how, how far you got. So um, I'm introducing Erica Sharon. She's a recovering alcoholic who struggled with anxiety and depression for years. Five years ago, she decided to start important work of healing from her past. She uses art as an outlet on her journey and has started two businesses along the way. Erica owns Erica's Board and Brush um, and Local Blessings. Anyone who is blessed to know her or follow her on social media knows how openly she shares her story to encourage and inspire others to become the best versions of themselves. Please help me in welcoming Erica as she shares her path to recovery. Sorry, one sec. I was just trying to share my sound. <laughs> yeah, sharing my story with you tonight. I am an alcoholic. I have almost five years sober. I want to talk to you about how art and getting involved in my community has helped uh, on my road to recovery. I'm gonna start uh, first with my story. So I'm gonna share a little bit of my background and what I feel led up uh, to, to some of my worst days as an alcoholic. Even though I believe that alcoholism or drug addiction is definitely a genetic thing, I do believe that there are certain circumstances in your life that you go through that kind of create the perfect storm that you might have um, that the genes to become an alcoholic, but because of certain trauma that you go through in your life, it causes when you pick up that drink or that drug, uh, it makes you have a certain reaction to it and leads you deeper into addiction and alcoholism. So I had gone through some trauma in my life. Some of my trauma included uh, growing up in a very, very strict religion with a lot of rules that was very judgmental. And then when I was 21 and my brother was 18, he committed suicide. So that also led, you know, to to the trauma that, that made me start drinking. As an adult, I think I was in my 20s when I took my first drink. I had had kids already. I have two kids now. They're um, 17 and 19. And I had them, but being raised in a very strict religion, I had never really gone out before. Well, we ended up leaving the religion and started, you know, going out and 
It was just that perfect storm hit me. I never really felt like I fit in with anyone growing up. I was painfully shy and when, but I had a, a mind that just raced so much. So when I took that, that first drink, I just liked what it did for me inside. And what ended up happening over a matter of several years is that I was drinking every day and it wasn't normal drinking. You know, a lot of people ask me, how do I know if I'm an alcoholic? Well, when I always say, what's your reaction to alcohol when you do drink? Once you start, can you stop? I was always thinking about, you know, when I could have that next drink. It was affecting my relationship with my children. I wasn't very reliable in life and it slowly just kept getting worse to where my self-esteem was very low. I had anxiety, depression. When I woke up in the morning, I would want to take a sleeping pill so that I could go back to sleep so that I didn't have to deal with everything anymore. So usually with a drug addict or alcoholic, they have to hit rock bottom before they they are ready to change. It's a disease. It's it's very, very hard to fight. It's the hardest battle I fought in my life. In August of 2016, I had gotten to a very low point and I was very sad. I didn't want to be here anymore. The only thing that was keeping me here was my kids and that scared me. I went to the hospital and I was in the psychiatric ward at the hospital for uh, four nights. You know, being in the psychiatric ward, I felt like I was crazy. I felt embarrassed, but I knew that I needed help. I still really didn't think that alcohol was the problem, even though it was. Uh, I had just told them, if you could just get my meds right, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. I'll be able to, to, you know, control my liquor and I won't be so depressed. So the doctor was like, no, you really need to stop drinking. And I said, no, you just need to get my meds right. But anyways, when I got out of the psychiatric ward, I did stop drinking for six weeks. And then, you know, I told myself like I did every time that it was okay to start again in moderation. But I ended up right back where I was with, you know, the daily uh, getting drunk and waking up with a hangover. And I was slowly realizing that I, I just didn't have control over this. It was November 28th. So almost five years ago now in 2016, I had started going to these board classes at a board painting studio in Roscoe. So if you guys don't know what board painting is, it's like this and you uh, sand and stain the wood and then you paint the stencils on them. Anyways, I had gone with friends several times to this uh, board making studio in Roscoe and I just loved everything about making these boards. And the second time I went, I had this crazy thought that maybe I could do something like this on my own uh, in people's like garages and basements and teach these classes. And I was working for a financial advisor at the time and, you know, part time and didn't didn't totally love it. I wanted to do something that set my soul on fire. But I knew that if drinking was involved with it, I just um, wasn't going to be reliable with it. So November 28th of 2016, I went, made a board with my friends, got really drunk. I drank way too much wine. And I text my boss that night and I said, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to do these board parties and women's garages and basements. And yeah, that's what I'm going to do. It was like a Sunday night. But when I was drinking, I made very sporadic decisions, did not think anything through. And the next morning I woke up totally hungover and I was like, oh crap, I quit my job last night. I said I was doing these board parties. I don't even have the machine to cut the stencils, nor do I have money to buy that. I don't own any power tools, anything like that. Totally didn't think it through. But there was something inside of me that said, this is your chance. You really want to do this. You want to be successful. You are so unhappy and unfulfilled in life. And you need to just do this. But I knew, I knew I had tried so many times to make, you know, keep alcohol as a part of my life. I guess that I didn't want to stop drinking partly because I thought that my life wouldn't be fun. I thought that I wouldn't be normal. You know, all my, most all of my friends drank and I thought, wow, like what would it be like to go out, you know, for dinner or to a party and not drink? Like everyone would look at me like I'm weird and, and I just... 
I didn't want to be labeled an alcoholic and I didn't want to be boring. I didn't want to have a boring life. I decided uh, that I was going to put alcohol out of my life if I was going to be successful and start this board business. I got my butt back to AA. I'd been there several times, but never stuck with it. I didn't really want to do the hard things uh, that they told me I was going to have to do and work through some emotional stuff from my past. So I just, you know, didn't go. This time I was like, I need to make a change. I need this to work. So I got my butt back to AA. As far as the business went, I decided that I was going to do this thing. So I got the stencil cutting machine. I knew nothing about it. I YouTubed everything on how to make these boards, how to cut the stencils. And I made a ton of mistakes, but I just would not stop trying. I was like, I'm going to be successful at this. I didn't give up. So I booked my first board party. I was super excited. Um, I think that was like two months after I made the decision to start. I had practiced some and my business over that first six months just kept growing. I would travel anywhere that someone was willing to do a board class and everyone would drink at the board classes, but I just told myself, you're not like them and that's okay that you're not like them. So about um, 10 months into the business, it was still going great and a local winery asked me to start doing the events there. It's funny, right? Like a recovering alcoholic at the winery, but they had such a big uh, base of clients. I was so excited to get in there to do events. And again, just every day, I kept not picking up the drink, kept doing the hard work with my sponsor, working through my emotional baggage from the past, going through the steps in AA. And we did our first event at the winery and it was so amazing and our customer base kept growing um i was able to bring on an employee i was so excited two months after that i was able to rent a little storefront in rockton um that's my hometown uh when i was about six months sober i did come out and share my journey on social media that i was an alcoholic i remember shaking and crying before i actually hit you know the post button on facebook I was scared, but I felt this need to be honest. And what ended up happening is that everyone just opened their arms and embraced me and my journey. And they were just so supportive of what I was doing. My relationships just started getting better. My relationships with my kids, you know, I remember my daughter used to um, want to go down to her bedroom at night um, because I was, you know, drunk most nights and she didn't want to converse with me. And we started to become the best of friends through this. And um, I get emotional talking about it. But, you know, right now she's she's 19, she's in college, and she is my best friend. And the changes that I've made in my life have, you know, allowed her to see what emotional health looks like. So back to the business aspect of it. Um, after two years in that little shop, we had totally outgrown it. So a building came up for sale in Rockton and it was huge and i was so excited it was right around the corner from my other location i wanted to purchase this building so bad but being an alcoholic i had worked um to reestablish my credit you know over the last few years and the first bank turned me down for a loan so then i went to a local bank and they had seen everything that i had done and you know they looked at all the financials and they approved me for the loan and that was probably one of the best days, you know, in my sobriety that I could see, you know, that I was making um, changes that all led up to this point. You know, people respected what I was doing now and I was able to buy a building on my own for this business. So we moved into this building and two weeks after that COVID hit and it was uh, crazy. I had a lot of fear and anxiety, but I'm not a quitter. So I moved everything back to uh, my house, to my garage, and we started doing these to-go kits. We would sand and stain the boards. So I would leave these to-go kits uh, with the board, the stencil, the paint in a deck box on my front step, and people would come pick them up leave their money in a little coffee can, and it totally saved my business. I was very blessed last November. I opened up a second business. It's a gift shop um, in the same building as my, so my business is called Erica's Board Creations, and the gift shop is called Local Blessings. Local because we carry products from over 20 local vendors. Blessings because my life is just a huge blessing now. Through COVID, you, I thought that everything was going to fall apart, 
and I just didn't give up. I prayed a lot. I try to always practice acceptance. I actually um, got a tattoo of that on my forearm because in the beginning in AA, I remember saying to myself so many times, and I still say it, that acceptance is the answer to all my problems. I can't change the people around me. I can't change what's happening in the world. I can just change how I react to it and how I, you know, choose to view things. By doing that, it's just brought me a lot of peace and I know that I don't have to drink over anything. I now have two businesses, the Erica's Board Creations and Local Blessings, and I love getting involved in my communities. I think it's important to talk about what helps me stay sober. So I consider making these boards a big part um, it played a big part in my recovery. So when you're doing art or for me making these boards, you don't think about anything else. And I remember in the early days of my sobriety, just sitting up at night because that was when my mind would race a lot and I would paint boards. And when I was painting, all I thought about was what was right in front of me and it calmed my mind and it really, you know, just gave me so much peace during that time. And it still does, even though I've grown a, a very big business out of this now, I still paint boards myself and find it to be very, very therapeutic. If you are struggling, I would recommend a couple things. Reach out for help. You know, you need a support system. You need to find someone that is being successful in their sobriety, but not just someone that's staying sober, someone that's that's happy, that's enjoying life. It took me, I'll be honest, it took me several years to really truly be a happy sober person. I try to live every day to the fullest and just practice gratitude for all the good things that are around me. And that, you know, look for someone to help you that is um, doing that in their life. And then for me, um, I find art and running to be therapeutic, working with plants, you know, whatever it is for you. For some people, it's cooking, baking, you know, find something that helps calm you. And you might have to try several different things before you find what actually works for you. Also, community is very, very important to me. Um, I try to give back because I feel like I've been blessed with so much and given so much. I try to give back anywhere I can. It helps me to share my story with others. If everything that I went through in my life, um, I feel that it was for a reason. And I feel that my purpose is to help others who are struggling now. And every week I get messages from people that say, thank you for sharing your story. Uh, I'm struggling. I'm an alcoholic or my mom's struggling. You know, she's an alcoholic. How can I help her? And I'm able to talk to them and to set them up for success as far as, you know, I, I can help or find other people, you know, that are a good fit to help them. So I would say definitely find your people. Get to an AA meeting. There's strength in numbers. And when you're struggling at night and you want to give in and, and take that drink, you need someone that you can call. Thank you so much for letting me share my story uh, with you guys. I hope that you can come visit my business sometime, Erica's Board Creations and Local Blessings in Rockton. Um, and just know that if you're struggling and you feel defeated and alcoholism or drug addiction has its grip on you, there is such a better life out there for you. You just have to make the decision that you've had enough and you have to do the hard work of getting better and finding something like art, fitness, um, different things like that along the way um, to just sink into and take your mind off of the addiction and then to get involved with people in the community can make all the difference. So thanks for letting me share. Awesome. Thank you, Erica, for sharing your story. Um, obviously, we know sharing stories um, helps encourage people, and you've been a huge encouragement to me and Erica's board creation. Um, I was one of those people <laughs> that actually um, was picking stuff up at your doorstep over COVID because art is a big part of my um, release and my mental health when I'm struggling as well. So, Next, thank you for sharing that. Next, I want to introduce um, Brian Knight. Brian Knight grew up in a small town in Wisconsin. He has always appreciated the need for family and community. Brian enjoys being active by exercising, playing all sorts of sports, and being in, in the outdoors in general. His favorite activities are soccer and ice fishing. 
Brian had his own battle with addiction. His story led him to seek treatment in Utah in 2015. After completing treatment, Brian decided to continue his care in the U Utah community. It's there where he started to find his purpose. Throughout different work with sober gyms, sober sports, and support groups, Brian began to realize his passion for helping others. Brian began at Aqua Recovery as an alumni director in 2017, and in spring of 2018, he felt a strong desire to be closer to his family as well as help bring resources to the people of the Midwest. Brian transitioned to an outreach and administration role and currently resides in Roscoe. Brian can passionately help and um, relate to individuals who are struggling as he leads them to their own journey of recovery. Some of the techniques that he uses to stay sober is being active in sports, exercise, and nutrition. He has found that these methods work for him to stay healthy in both mind and spirit. Brian is also a teen group hope facilitator for NAMI. Please help me in welcoming Brian to share his path to recovery. Hello, my name is Brian Knight. I am 32. Um, I struggle with bipolar, depression, and also I am coming up on seven years clean and sober from an alcohol and uh, crack addiction that I used to cope with my mental health. So I think as I start, I think it's really important to kind of give a, a back story before I go into what I do now and, and how I manage. So um, for me, you know, growing up, I grew up in a really small town up in Wisconsin and um, drinking was a pretty common way of life, right? Like it was a very socially accepted thing to do. And, and that's kind of what I um, grew up around seeing. And, and that was the norm. Um, for me, I, I grew up in a pretty toxic home. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother was an addict. Um, so different challenges for me growing up came of that, a lot of which stemmed around abandonment from my mother. Um, my father was very emotionless unless it was anger. Um, so I was taught to hide emotions, hide feelings, and then there wasn't a lot of, you know, I love you, I'm proud of you. So naturally, as a child, when you are exposed to that sort of environment, you seek alternative ways to have those feelings and needs met. Um, so for me, it started out as a very young age of, of drinking. So I started drinking when I was 11 years old. And when I drank, I was able to escape the negative mental health aspects that I was suffering with um, because alcohol allowed me to be free in a sense. It allowed me to numb. It allowed me to, you know, not really feel like I wasn't good enough, that I wasn't loved, that I had abandonment issues. I didn't feel any of that when I drank. I just felt like I was accepted. Right. And, and during that time in my life, and really as I grew up into my twenties, I never realized that I had mental health and nor did I realize I had an addiction. Um, I finally got sober at the age of 26. So I went to, I went to a treatment center um, where I first started to discover not necessarily, you know, the addiction. I, I started to understand like, wow, I really have some core issues that I need to, to focus on. And, and what we know about addiction is it all stems back to mental health. Right. Whether it be depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, trauma, you know, abandonment, grief, codependency, all these things that we that we suffer from as as humans. We learn that you cope with it in a way that's not always necessarily healthy. Right. Um, for, so for me, it just looked like it was it was drinking. Right. That was where where my that was my way of coping. So. When I got sober, I started to understand what was really happening. And that was that I was using alcohol as a way for my brain to perceive that I was I was going to be okay, right? Because alcohol attacks a very specific part of our brain. 
right? It's, it attacks our, our midbrain, our limbic system as, as I'm taught. And which is the part of your brain that really regulates your flight or flight mechanisms, your survival instincts. So the way it was explained to me was um, as you get exposed in life, not even just like my stories as a child, but any, any situation, as you get exposed in life to certain circumstances, whether it be real positive or negative, the majority of it negative, right? And you can numb out in a way that I did with alcohol, my brain will start to perceive the use of alcohol as a way to quote unquote survive, right? And not I'm not talking like I'm going to die if I don't drink, but I'm not going to be able to deal with my depression unless I drink. I'm not going to be able to deal with the fact that my mother walked out on me when I was 13 unless I drink. I'm not going to be able to deal with the fact that I have jealousy and insecurity issues stemming from abandonment unless I drink. So that's the way my brain utilized alcohol to get through my day and, and ultimately survive in a sense. When I removed the alcohol and I decided to get sober at the age of 26, I had a lot of emotions that I had not dealt with, right? I had a lot of feelings. I had a lot of anxiety all of a sudden. I had my depression. I really felt depression for the first time in my life. Like I always felt sad, but this time I really understood that like I'm, I'm depressed. Um, and then it was also the first time when I was diagnosed with bipolar, which explained a lot of my mood swings, a lot of my up, my manic states, my impulsivities, um, which I always just kind of assumed was like normal for me, but I was able to really understand that, Hey, I have more going on than just I'm drinking too much. So when I got sober, mental health was where I put my entire focus. That's what I really believed was my issues, right? It wasn't like, yeah, I was drinking too much. And yeah, I was, I was using alcohol in ways that I shown it. And more importantly, when I was drinking, my behaviors were just way off, right? Like insecurities that I would have, the way I would act when I was drunk, just things that would go against my norm, my morals that I wouldn't do if I wasn't drinking. So when I decided to get sober, it was, how do I better live as a human, right? And, and that stemmed from everything to physical activities, to service work, to nutrition, um, basically entire essence and a holistic approach to my life, right? Like no longer could I decide that I'm just going to eat out three days three times a day, right? Because now, as I know, if I go eat McDonald's today at noon for lunch, you know what's going to happen to me? I'm going to end up being super lethargic. I'm not going to be motivated. I'm going to want to take an afternoon nap. I'm not going to be productive at my job. And I'm going to ultimately sit on my couch and do nothing. And when I sit on my couch and do nothing, the first place that I get into is my head. And when I'm in my head, all the old negative thinking patterns, you know, the way I speak to myself, it all comes back. So learning that what I put in my body, and I'm not 100% vegan, I'm not gluten-free, like I don't have like 100%, you know, very strict diet. It's just being mindful of what I eat because what I eat ultimately affects my mood and my ability to go through my day and do the things that I need to do to stay in a good headspace. So nutrition was a big part of early recovery and still to, to this day, like I try not to eat fast food, you know, sugars, coffee afternoon, uh, because ultimately I'll be sitting there. If I decide to have a coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon, and then I'll lay in my bed at 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'll be sitting there wondering why I can't fall asleep. Right. And then that sets me up for failure the next day. I don't get up on time. I'm in a bad headspace. I'm, you know, trying to rush out the door, different things. Um, another big part of my, my early recovery and, and learning how to sustain my positive mental health was finding passion and purpose again. You know, things that I used to enjoy doing as a kid that I did not do anymore because I was spending too much time going to the bar, right? For me, that was a sports were a big thing. So where, where I got sober was out in Utah and, you know, we did a lot of 
a lot of sober activities, you know, from mountain climbing to sober sports, like sober softball, sober soccer. And the reason they're called sober is because everyone you're playing with is also in recovery, right? From mental health, addictions. So I was surrounding myself with like-minded individuals while doing positive engagements. You know, on Friday night, instead of going to the bar, we'd all hang out and play softball. Um, on the weekends, we'd get out, get out into the mountains, go do some sort of activity. Where now, now that I live out here in in Rockford, it's it's the same sort of approach. You know, my life is drastically different. Like I have two children now. I have two young kids, two and five. But my approach is pretty much the same, right? Whether it's getting out, going to do an activity with my kids, whether it's going hiking around here. Um, I love going paddle boarding, stand up paddle boarding. You know, I take my kids fishing, whatever I can possibly do to wake up in the morning and get out of my house and go do something engaging for my mind out in nature is a huge part of recovery. For me, you know, unfortunately, it's not not necessarily support groups, individual therapy anymore. You know, it is still a part of it. But for me, it's just a different way of staying sober and, and keeping my mental health in, in, intact. And the more I do these things, the better off I am overall. So I notice and I track and I do kind of experiments, you know, for one, I gave up coffee for like six months just to see you know, how much that affected my actual mental health, right? Like I was really starting to wonder like, wow, I drink a lot of coffee, but I have so much anxiety all the time. So I gave up coffee and all of a sudden it was weird. I didn't have so much anxiety, right? So starting to understand just like what my body, what I put into my body is telling my brain. Um, some of the things that I really want to do now out in this community and I feel like others have engaged and said, you know, I'd really want to do that too, is some sort of community activities, right? Like once a weekend, get out, whether that's exercising, whether that's playing a sober sport, you know, whether that's going for a hike or, you know, whatever that may be, that's really what I'd like to bring to the community now and have other people who are like-minded like me trying to do the same things, but yet struggle and are willing to talk about those struggles because that is a lot of power in just being able to speak about, you know, where we're at today and what we're struggling with today. So for me, I mean, I, I've, I kind of mentioned what I struggled with as a child. And those are all things that are relevant. But luckily for me, I put in so much work over the last seven years where I'm at a good place with that. That doesn't mean I don't struggle anymore. I still have bipolar. I still get depression, right? I still have anxiety. It just looks like a, in a different form for me. So staying on my medications, continuing doing therapy is part of my life. But the most important thing for me is that I have a daily routine that I need to accomplish every single day. My fiance just introduced me to Reiki. It's a new way of just kind of meditating because meditation is such a big part too. Um, being able to stay in a positive mindset and just calming myself because my biggest issue is right here. Like my head is my biggest issue and it's very quick how fast I can get myself to be a negative thinker again, to really, you know, get myself down. So we want to make sure that we're just doing everything that we possibly can, you know, and, and a big justification is I just don't have the time, right? Oh, I got, I, I don't have time to be able to go do some of these things. Well, we need to be able to make time. We need to be able to set some time aside, some time aside, right? Whether that's waking up an hour earlier, going to bed an hour later, you know, finding an hour here or there in your day where you're doing something productive and positive. So for me, you know, as we speak about holistic treatments and alternatives, it's for me, it's just, it breaks down to nutrition. It breaks down to, you know, some sort of exercise you know, and ultimately just finding passion and purpose again, because what that does is it helps you learn how to emotionally regulate, right? If, if you're someone who struggles with addiction or mental health in general, right? Like you probably don't have a lot of emotions. Like that's where I was at. I didn't have a lot of emotions. They were, they were just pretty, it was either I was angry or I was sad, right? And there wasn't a ton of in-between to that. Um, 
so holistically, when you start to do different meditations, like whether it be music therapy, art therapy, which are other things that I really like to do, um, you know, puzzles is something I like to do, you know, different, different ways to engage my mind. It teaches you to slow down. It teaches you to, to breathe and ultimately learn how to process through some of those emotions. Um, and that's why I said passion and purpose, right? For me, like I said, it's soccer, it's softball, it's, it's frisbee golfing, it's fishing. It's just anything outdoors, whatever that might look like for you. I encourage you to find it because that's what you, that's what we're trying to accomplish here is a way to start to bring back some of those positive emotions. Cause when you speak of mental health, you know, nobody says I have depression and I'm the happiest person in the world. That's not how it usually looks, right? It's usually the complete opposite. It's usually the negative emotions. So however we can find ourselves in a position to encourage positivity, it, it's huge, right? It's huge. So for me, again, sober sports, I'm someone, I want to be outside. I want to be doing things. I want to, if you're someone who's like-minded like me and wants to do things, you know, by all means, let's get together and, and do something. Cause it's really hard to find people who are, who are struggling, who are willing to talk about their struggles and yet do something about it. And, and that's the type of person I am. That's the type of person I'd like to be, because like I mentioned too, service is a huge thing and, and what better way to be engaged with others than to do things with the people that are struggling, just like you. Right. That, that's to me, that's, there's a lot of power in that. It's a lot of it's a it's a big way to be able to recover. So I hope what I said today uh, helps. I'm here for any questions that you guys have, and never be afraid to just reach out and ask for help. Thank you, Brian, for sharing your story. I've had the pleasure of. Um, I think I can't. I was trying to remember if it's been a year or two years. It feels like it's been a long, a long time since I met you at a softball tournament and we connected and you've been doing teen groups with me. And I know you've been a positive impact and had a positive impact on the teens in the group and in my life as well. So thank you for sharing your story. Next, I get to introduce Dr. Natalie Richards. She is the owner um, and chiropractor at Revive Chiropractic Wellness Center in Rockford, Illinois. She grew up in the area and has always been passionate about bringing health and wellness to everyone she meets. She was a chiropractic patient from birth and saw firsthand the amazing things that chiropractic work can do. She experienced a decrease in migraines and speedy recovery from countless sports injuries as a child. Dr. Natalie knew she had a passion for helping people, so she decided to attend Palmer College of Chiropractic in Davenport, Iowa to start her profession as a chiropractor. Since then, she has continued to stay current with the newest and most effective techniques in her growing field. Dr. Natalie is trained in many chiropractic techniques. She additionally has extensive training in sports injuries and extremity adjusting. Dr. Natalie is also certified in Webster technique by the ICPA and is qualified to take care of pregnant and pediatric patients. Her passion is helping her patients achieve optimal health, state of health and wellness in all areas of life. Would you help me in welcoming Dr. Natalie to share? Hi, so I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Natalie Richards. I'm the owner and chiropractor at uh, Revive Chiropractic Wellness Center in Rockford, Illinois. Um, I want to thank NAMI for having me speak today. Um, I think it's a really interesting topic and something that is super important um, in every day that I see patients, um, just kind of tying in the mental health aspect with the structural, functional muscular aspect of what I do. Um, so I want to first explain a little bit about uh, what chiropractic is, what I deal with every day. Um, so I'll show you guys this little spine model here. I'm sure a lot of you have seen uh, models like this before. 
But um, this is what I, as a chiropractor, deal with. I'm dealing with the bones, nerves, and muscle attachments that um, occur in the spine and uh, in the extremities. So that would be arms, legs, uh, jaw, things like that. Um, So what happens in chiropractic is there's certain areas of the spine that become a little bit stuck or sticky, um, and that decreases the range of motion of the spine. And what happens is that these little nerves coming out the side here, these are all um, nerves that are coming from the brain, which is sitting right here on top of the head, on top of the spine. Uh, The brain sends signals down into these nerves, and then these nerves actually go out to every organ, muscle, tissue, cell of your body, um, and kind of tell it what to do. Um, And then on the other end of that, those organs and cells and tissues send signals back up through these nerves, up through the spinal column and to the brain, and gives feedback to the brain. So in a normal healthy spine, we have normal nerve flow going up and down from the brain to the body and from the body up to the brain. That is in a normal human being, that's what we want to see all the time. Now what happens is that sometimes those sticky areas cause a dysfunction in the nerve pathway and it actually causes um, somewhat of a roadblock. And it actually truly is a roadblock because it actually prevents that normal communication between the brain and the body and the body and the brain. So um, what can happen is is those messages that usually would be um, sent from the body to the brain are no longer able to be transmitted. Or it almost sounds like uh, it's in a different language. So the brain can't interpret what the body is telling it to do. Um, And sometimes there's um, no mechanical or structural reason for the pain, but the signals are kind of blocked to the brain. So it it just doesn't, it's not getting there the way that it's supposed to. Um, So even after the pain is gone, sometimes the brain is still misinterpreting those signals because it hasn't received the signal that everything's fine. So the brain may actually interpret that as there's still pain going on, but there is no stimulus back to the brain saying that that it's gone. So I'll put this down for a second. Um, A lot of times when that's happening is that will actually lead to a chronic pain condition, and there may not be a reason for that pain, Um, but that doesn't make it any less real because that is your brain interpreting these false signals in kind of a maladaptive way. It's not the way that we would want our bodies to to respond to these signals. Um, And I have a lot of patients that are that way where sometimes I will have somebody come in and they, you know, have had pain in a certain area for years and years and years, and maybe they are moving okay. And there's not like a, there's not a serious um, condition that would be causing this pain, but they still have it. And a lot of times a MD or, you know, a prescribing doctor will prescribe some sort of an opioid or um, some sort of narcotic to help numb that pain down and actually just numb the brain's response to it, basically. Um, And that is where people get into a little bit of a problem because you're not actually addressing the root cause of that problem or of that pain. A lot of times the root cause is a chiropractic subluxation um, and that that is what I deal with. That's that sticky area that a, an adjustment will kind of break through. Um, so a lot of times people who have chronic pain, there's just some sort of signal. There's, there's a roadblock in that signal pathway. Um, so that's something that I deal with quite often actually in my practice. Um, and a lot of times I do it can actually help people get off of their opioid prescriptions or, um, maybe prevent that prescription from ever being written in the first place, which is, I think, really where um, we need to focus is is actually trying to get to the root before somebody gets to this point of of chronic pain uh, because it's really hard to deal with at that point. Um, I have friends who have gone through that exact same scenario where, you know, they 
have had pain for a long time, or even after a surgery, this can be an acute condition as well. Um, it doesn't take much for somebody to become addicted to those types of medications. That's not you know rocket science to to figure out. So if we can eliminate the need for those prescriptions ever to be written, I think that that can stop a cascade effect in its tracks. And that's a really important thing in my in my opinion. Um, so really, we're kind of dealing with this opioid crisis now, and I think chiropractors and chiropractic as a profession has actually done a pretty good job of, of trying to be another source of relief for people who may have may otherwise be given those prescriptions. Um, so we've actually been hitting these campaigns pretty hard trying to help people realize that there's maybe another option for dealing with their pain. Um, and actually, the opioid crisis, the opioid epidemic that they call it sometimes, um, typically, I think when a lot of us think about that, it's maybe younger populations that we think of dealing with this sort of thing. But actually, there's been some data that's just come out that actually the aging population, so those people over the age of 65, are actually having more of a problem with addiction to opioids than they ever have in the past. I don't understand what the mechanism is behind that, but I think doctors are just saying, oh, let's just, you know, let's just write a prescription. They're fine. They don't have a job to go to. They don't have anything that um, might be, that the opioid or narcotic might cause a problem for, and they just say, oh, it's fine. They don't, they don't have anything to worry about. They can just take that. Um, but it ends up causing a lot of, a lot of issues in the older population as well. Um, leading to other types of addiction. Um, so I think it's a it's a problem truly through every age group that um, that I see at least. Um, so in addition to chronic pain, there's also our chronic stress that we're that we deal with all the time, whether that be physical stress, emotional stress, um, just a psychological stress, which almost everyone deals with, but um, it, it kind of exists on a spectrum depending on how much it affects your body. Um, so this is one of the areas where actually something more psychological can actually create um, a bodily symptom. And this happens all the time. And I see people every single day who come in and I'm like, oh, you're a little stressed out today, aren't you? Because they're maybe like right through here, they have some tightness in their traps, um, the rhomboids right between the shoulder blades. Um, one area that kind of gets overlooked sometimes is that a lot of people actually carry stress in their pelvic area. Um, and sometimes that can be trauma related, it could be sexual trauma related, um, but in general, sometimes stress likes to harbor where maybe we've had a physical trauma or emotional trauma uh, before. So um, there really is quite a strong connection between what the brain is doing and how the brain is processing stress It can be completely um, emotional stress or physical stress or um, job stress, something like that. Um, and those types of stressors actually can cause bodily problems. Um, another one is, you know, low back pain. Low back pain is super closely related to stress and even depression. Those two things kind of go hand in hand quite a bit. Um, so um, a lot of times, <clears throat> as I said, we hold our stress in areas of previous trauma. Um, also, I'll hear people say they feel like they need to take something or do something to take the edge off or to help them relax. I have to have a drink after work because I just have to relax or um, I have to take this prescription. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I can't relax and I have so much anxiety that I can't handle anything. Um, and that's super common. It, it is so common. Um, so people are really that chronic stress really leads to a reliance on and a dependence on external substances to kind of help cope. Whereas maybe an adjustment can just kind of break through that tightness um, and release that tension that the body's holding, whether in that in the bodily areas, and help send a signal back up to the brain saying, everything's good, everything's fine. Um, the problem that people get into is that it creates this positive feedback loop. So what that means is that 
the brain is sending a stress signal down to the body and the body gets tight and then that tightness creates more stress and then you're still stressed at your job or you're still stressed at life and that creates even more tightness and you go through this loop where nothing's really breaking through that. I find that with a lot of people, the adjustment process of going to see a chiropractor actually helps to stop that feedback loop in its tracks, which I think is really, really important. Um, The other part to all of this is that Uh, We all have a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system. Some people have heard of those terms. Sympathetic just means it's that fight or flight response. Um, And that area of the spine that deals with that fight or flight response is from about the lower part of your neck down to the upper part of your lower back. And um, that's where a lot of people will hold, hold tension And when you have tension in that area, you're actually stimulating those nerves. So you're actually stimulating that fight or flight response and you're not allowing the body to calm down and to what they call rest and digest, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. So a lot of times people will feel like they're always on or they're always, um, they can't relax or can't recover or can't sleep or and then you have to take a sleeping pill and then you, you just go along this whole, this whole cascade of, of problems really. Um, so a lot of times just opening up that middle part of the back is so helpful. I had a kid in here the other day, um, he was about seven he was already experiencing all these signs of uh, ADHD and um, just kind of that always on type of feeling. And I adjusted his middle back and immediately after he said, oh, I feel peace. And that is, I think, what a lot of the adult patients feel as well, um, but they don't necessarily explain it in that way. So I thought that was really cool just to hear him say, oh, I feel peace. To be able to bring that to somebody is really, really special. So I think um, some people are missing out on those feelings, and it's really, really tough to deal with this without having somebody help you, like myself, to actually release that tension in those areas. So um, that really helps to calm down the nervous system and really, really can help restore those connections between the brain and the body, and that's really the whole point of uh, seeing a chiropractor is to help your body cope with those external, um, whether it's pain, stress, um, anything like that, an injury, uh, it really does help the body to cope. Um, So I think um, it's just super important, I think, also to work with different providers. So if you're somebody or you know somebody who is going through something like this, maybe they have these bodily symptoms and they're dealing with addiction or they're dealing with any sort of mental health uh, condition. Uh, It's really important, as I have found out, to really work with other practitioners. So I, as a chiropractor, also work with mental health counselors, um, psychiatrists, um, and other mental health professionals to try to create this collaborative care and really help the patient to decrease stress and decrease all this stimulus, all these stimuli, um, external problems uh, all together. So I think that's that's probably where the future of all of this is going, is really we need to just collaborate with with a multitude of different healthcare professionals in order to get people um, the care and the help that they need. So um, you can feel free to reach out to me Uh, My website is revivecwc.com. I appreciate you all listening. And um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, You can look up Revive Chiropractic Wellness Center in Rockford online and uh, get a hold of me that way. Have a great day. Bye. Um, Thank you, Dr. Natalie, for sharing that. Um, Something that really stood out to me as you were sharing was about the um, holding our pain in certain areas of our body. And I personally have a trauma related to losing my son to suicide. And that did manifest in some pain in that area that I was directly affected by. So I really related to that and understand that. And that was something that I learned um, going through that post-traumatic stress myself and finding that physical pain sometimes is associated with trauma and mental pain as well. So 
Um, thank you for sharing your story and um, what you do is so important. And, it's, and like you said, there's so many different things out there that we can, you know, each of you guys shared something a little different um, in your story, whether it's, you know, art and creativity, whether it's exercise and activity and sports, or whether it's connecting with mental um, and physical different types of providers that can help um, kind of all those things combined can help us in different ways and get us healthier um, in both mind and body. And that's kind of what we wanted to present tonight. And just from a, a, a lens of that addiction and substance abuse, because I know when I started learning about mental health, like I never really connected substance abuse and addiction as a mental illness. Um, but I teach mental health first aid now to the community and individuals and organizations. And, you know, we know that mental, that substance abuse is a mental illness. It's part of that realm, right? And so we teach on that. So thank you for all being here tonight. And I'm going to turn it over to um, Danielle to kind of see if we have any questions. And if not, close us out and talk about what we have coming up the rest of this week for Mental Illness Awareness Week. Yeah, I've not seen any questions so far, but feel free to ask everyone. Um, you can put them in the chat or on Facebook. Um, do either of you three have any um, closing words while we wait for questions? Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I really appreciate you all for doing this. Um, I really enjoy listening to people's stories and you're just sharing, you know, a wealth of knowledge with the community. So we really appreciate you. Oh, I know you have something. <laughs> <laughs> well, if not, I will wait for a minute, but um, tomorrow we have a showing of A Silent Voice at the Nordloff Center at 5.45. If y'all are interested, no reservations are necessary. You can walk right in. Um, it's an anime film that's focused on kind of the things that teens go through, whether it's bullying, um, depression, suicidal ideation. Um, one second. Sue, do you have your hand up? Do you want to talk? Do you want to type it in the chat box? Mm -hmm. No, I hit that by accident. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, Thursday night, we have at Stateline Church, Be Kind to Your Mind, um, the power of mental health ministries and kind of trying to tie people to resources in the area. And then on Friday, we'll wrap everything up with our rally for mental health at Veterans Memorial Hall at noon. Again, all, all are welcome. All these events are free. Um, keep watching our social media for more amazing stories from local people. And that's all I got if there are no questions. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And thank you for you guys and sharing your stories. That means the world to us. And that's all about what Mental Illness Awareness Week is about, is just sharing stories, letting people know they're not alone on their journey. And there's, there's different ways to um, recovery and, and healing through um, your journey. So thank you, guys. Have a great night. And we'll see you next time.